Thanks, Kiralee, and thanks for the, uh, the locals for the opportunity to come up and speak today on a topic that's a little bit different for this part of the world. Uh, Peter, that was a fantastic presentation. Well done. It's, uh, it really sort of puts in perspective when, I guess, advisors or researchers talk about some of this stuff, but when a grower gets up and absolutely nails about three or four of the things of the big six that he was sort of outlining, it gives you a lot of, a lot of confidence that uh, we're on the right track. So my, my talk is a little bit of a, a change from what was in the agenda originally. Um, Kiralee ran into, uh, into Rob Long in, uh, in Adelaide and, and we were sort of saying we might actually change the, uh, away from the crops and, and pastures rotation work to, um, to, to something that's really creating a lot of interest in our part of the world and uh, potentially has a big fit for your, for your area too. So it's, it's about uh, weeds, water and yield. I've just got a quick video here that Kiralee put together a couple of years ago. It actually just explains or just highlights how the, the strip and disc system works. So there's a, a nine metre CTF system with a, a grower in our part of the world who's been doing this for about four years. Um, basically that was a, a reasonable harvest in 15 and uh, he's gone back into that with his uh, XL Double Warrior on, uh, on actually he's on seven inch, uh, which that machine, you look at it, so it's getting gummed up a bit there in that heavy straw. But uh, that's, uh, that's sort of the, the I guess, the, the epitome of how, in, in a video sense, how the, the strip and disc system works. So it's effectively the Shelbourne stripper front, like Peter talked about, harvesting high. So the whole idea, exactly what uh, was described earlier, rather than trying to cut it low and then attempt to spread it, particularly growers in, in CTF systems uh, with, with challenges like wind and, and different harvest conditions, you actually want to harvest as high as you can to leave as much residue as, as possible. Um, for all the reasons that, that we know for moisture retention. But then the idea is to come back and sow with a dish seeder. So it, it just, it, we just can't make this work with a tine seeder. It's, it's really difficult. So we, we've got a dish seeder on narrow rows, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about. It's, it's uh, something we've sort of uh, evolved with over time. And then it's enabling us in our part of the world. So obviously not that relevant in, the, in some of these dry scenes in the north. You just haven't had any chance to get any surface water, but we're, we're seeing planting opportunities that we wouldn't have dreamed of previously. So we're, we've got residual moisture at the surface uh, because of this, uh, this stubble carryover. But, but we can't do it with, with I guess, conventional um, weed management practices. We have to actually change our weed management as well. So that's a bit of the theme of what, what we're talking about. So you can't just stick you know, trifluoral and pre-emergent systems and uh, high serial rotations in this, in this system. It, it, it'll just bring you undone. Before I go any further, there's actually seats up the front. I know it's a bit like church, but yeah, we want you to sit down if you've registered this. No one ever wants to sit up the front, but uh, I invite you to come up and um, yeah, grab a seat. So uh, I just got to go through the big six again and how it actually fits into this strip and disc. So there's a, a photograph from a, a grower we work with uh, there's more Michael come right up. That, that's a, a chaff line uh, in, a, in a canola system from uh, north of Wagga. So we've been quite fortunate with some of the rain. So he actually got that crop up. So Hugh talked about the, the big six. So all, all the things that um, I guess weed smart and, and other I guess weeds communication people are talking about. So how does that fit into this strip and dish system? So probably the three ones that I, I want to highlight is that diverse rotations. Uh, and for us, that that's, that's, I guess, involves things like double breaks. So we grow a pulse and then canola. Um, it's a bit different from, say, a canola wheat um, rotation. Crop competition. So th this is a, a, a passionate, um, an area of, of interest for me. And I think that's something we, we've really got to take our blinkers off and think a lot harder about. There's so many free kicks with crop competition. Uh, and the last one is harvest weed seed control. So we've seen it already with, with, with Peter and Kylie with their uh, chaff decks. And that, that's something that needs to be incorporated in. So you've got a, another string to the bow in terms of how you might manage some of these harder to kill weeds when you're in high residue systems. So why strip and disc? Well, why have people gone this way? So it, it hasn't come from trips to America, or it hasn't come from, um, I guess, sort of uh, any research group that's told us that it's gonna be the way to go. It's come from farmers working out themselves. So we did a trip to South Australia uh, about six years ago, and these growers came back and, and really started questioning what they were doing and where they wanted to go. So they're cropping dominant operations, so pretty similar to some of the people in this room. They, um, they're, they're really spending a lot on things like fungicides, uh, your crops like canola, but we're pushing harder on more and more inputs, but we actually weren't getting more profit out, out of the other end. So 
um, we were sort of focusing on salt water, but actually all, all the sort of uh, agronomy around that wasn't giving us more profits. And, and some of these growers are looking for something a bit different too. It wasn't actually a satisfying thing that they had to get their next, their, their next profit driver wasn't coming out of a drum. So that's, that's the thinking. And they really want to gain control of some of their farming systems, so a bit, a bit more resilience around it. And this is a bit motherhood, but th these were the things that were driving these people to make these changes. Uh, and for us, it was managing moisture. Uh, and a lot of that moisture is at sowing time and, and carry over for, for late season. Uh, this is one that's a bit different in terms of wanting to reduce herbicide costs, but at lower weed numbers. So it's a bit of a, a, a challenging one. You think you've got to spend more money on herbicides to get weeds under control. With things like chaffed X, we're actually sort of seeing it's, it's the opposite. And we want to lessen the risk. So some of them are actually happy to accept a lower yield in certain crops, i.e. their pulses, but if that sets them up to grow another four or five hundred kilos per hectare in their canola the year after, that, that's a, a big motivator. And diversity. So diversity comes in many forms, but for them it's, it's diversity in their crop types, their crop rotations, and obviously their sources of income. So this is 2018, I took this photo. Um, that's a, a, a pretty handy hybrid canola crop in our area. It's been hit with a Kelly chain. There's been no sheep on that, so put, sheep get the blame for erosion unfairly in some cases in our part of the world, but that's, that's a, a machine that's done a lot of damage to a paddock that should be just no-tilled. Um, so it's just, uh, I think that's unacceptable. We, in our part of the world we spend money on, on things like lime and gypsum and um, sulphur and phosphorus, uh, and that, that paddock was just blowing. It, it, uh, for about uh, three or four days. And I can't really see how that's acceptable. So how do we come to this strip and disc system? So it's, it's been an evolution. Basically they're all the things that um, we probably learnt from you. Uh, the northern area has been leaders in things like stubble retention, fallow management, um, and we've sort of pushed that to our early sowing and double break rotation. So they're things that some of these, uh, I guess, continuous croppers have been sort of getting in uh, and having success with. But it just wasn't enough. But they wanted to go further, a bit like Peter outlined in his talk. So um, disc seeding has come in and, and CTF are a bit slower to adopt than what, than what you guys are. But um, narrow row spacings has been another, another one. So we were out at 12 and 13 and 15. That, that hasn't worked. So things like ryegrass just love wide rows. Um, and we're, we're losing yield because of it as well. So narrow row spacings, stripper fronts, and, and other, other tools like crop topping and harvest weed seed control are coming into play as well to enable complementary practices like the, the big four up the front, so the stubble retention and the, and the early sowing. So disc seeding, so that's an XL high lift machine on six and a half inch row spacings. Uh, we've got uh, quite a few of those in our part of the world and XL actually came to us and said, we do not understand why your growers are wanting to buy these things, um, that we just can't, can't understand what their thinking is. So, and Stuart Kings at Excel, to his credit, has been really keen to, to sort of uh, understand what our thinking is behind the systems. And, uh, and Anton Kowalenko from John Deere are here as well. They've said the same thing. They wanted, they're selling these machines, but didn't really understand why, because it's a bit different to what people are ordering previous. So we've got you know, two single disc manufacturers out there happy to narrow their row spacings up. So we've got zero till, retained stubble, it's, it's nothing new for what you're uh, familiar with. But it's that retaining soil moisture at sowing. So for us, we tend to start on a sowing date. Um, we dry sow, we're a bit different to some of your winter crops. So um, I, I guess Warwick might outline some of that a bit later on. But we, we just have a set time for sowing, whether it's rained or not, and we have a finish date. So we really like to be finished by the, the 15th of May, for example, whether you put in 1,000 hectares or, or 8,000 hectares. Uh, so the logistics sort of operate around that. And no clods. So I see with some of our clay soils, uh, medium textured, heavy textured clay soils have been dry sown for a period of, of five to six years. So we do get some autumn rain, but generally it's dry sown. They're getting clods on clods. So they're, they're like a, a medium sized house brick. And, and that, if you don't get wet enough sort of conditions through the winter, that, that clod will stay there for three years, so we, we see it pretty commonly. So even with the application of gypsum and, and amelioration um, tactics like that, it's still not breaking those clods down. Because we come back and then dry sow it the next year. So how do we get rid of the clods? We have to Kelly chain it. So that, that's not sustainable. So pre-emergent herbicides, moisture conservation at the surface don't work if you keep doing that to your soils year in, year out. So some of our soils have actually gone backwards compared to when we first started direct drilling with a flexi coil 20 years ago. 
So then we bring in the narrow row spacing. So I'll talk a little bit about the yield side of it, but again, for weed competition and ground cover, it, it, it's a real driver for us. It's, it's been a big wake up call. We've actually seen growers go to that six and a half inch dish seeder, um, what it can do for us uh, in terms of uh, even weeds like sow thistle. So we just seem to think when we, uh, we might have a crop of barley with, uh, on 12 inch compared to seven inch, the, uh, the sow thistle just, it, it, it still grows, but it struggles to set seed. So that's the thinking. So you still have weeds in the system, but they're just struggling to set seed. So if you've got less seed going in, you've got less to try and target year after. So dish seeding, uh, this is a, a, a dish a unit, a seven, oh, it's actually 7.1 yeah, inch row spacing uh, that was set up this year. They, um, they've been dish seeding for a long time on 10, so they've gone back to seven. Um, for us, it's, it's about attention to detail. So we really try and get these things through to the grower that if you're gonna go down a dish seeding path compared to a, a tine seeder, you've got to focus on, the, on what the stubble was like at harvest time. Penetration, you want downward force penetration. We put a lot of emphasis on this, getting good seed soil contact. So people that do dish seeding badly, it, it's a disaster. But if it's done well, it, it, and there's a really good network of growers that have driven this for us, uh, you could, it's a pretty positive outcomes in terms of some of the, uh, the um, uniform establishments we've seen in, in dry seasons. Sharp dish, so we're pretty, pretty anal on that, changing dish as they get blunt, particularly in some of our stony country. Seed firming wheels, there's a lot of really good work that's come out of the US with people like Phil Needham uh, or, or, and the Xapta group in, in terms of having um, your, your gear set up for single disc seeding and you've got to close that furrow. So that's that crumbler wheel you see in the back of that photo, it's just critical for us and we think it helps with, with pre-emergent uh, herbicide activity as well. But it's not without its challenges, disc seeding, so we, we know that chaff can be pretty toxic, uh, hair pinning which is, you're probably fairly familiar with in, in your part of the world here where the, the, uh, the disc actually pushes the chaff into the furrow and you try and plant a seed onto that, onto that uh, stubble, so that, that's, that's not good. Um, so yeah, having a harvest set up is, is quite critical. So we actually talk growers out of going to a disc seeder if they're still running, so a 2388 or an older header, where we know they're just not gonna get good spread um, and chopping from that machine. There's a higher maintenance required uh, with changing discs, and it's not a pleasant task, uh, as those in the audience will know, and the cost of that. And we always say see higher insect pressure with things like slugs, millipedes, slaters, earwigs. So that's, that's something that needs to be managed, and we're still learning our way on that. Interest, interesting enough for us, the main crop that gives us the pressure for the insects is canola. So when we look at our pulses, chickpeas, favours, um, all our cereals, we don't have that pressure, it's just canola, so that's, uh, that's just an interesting point. Sorry. There's less pre-em herbicide options, there's no doubt about it. We take trifluralin out of our cereal phase, it obviously adds cost, you've got to use more soluble herbicides like Secura, Box of Gold, but I, I guess it's a, a, a bit of a throwaway line in our part of the world that agronomists prefer Tines, so gentlemen prefer blondes. It's for us, it's agronomists prefer tines. It, it is easier, it's safer, there's a system that's well established, but I, I'd probably challenge that. I, and I think that with this seeding systems in these high residue, um, I guess, scenarios, the crop diversity, such as the double break system, um, which allows you to use different chemicals at different times of year, um, provides that, that flexibility. So now a rose, there's a crop of planet barley. Uh, sewn on six and a half inch into a four ton lancer stubble from last year. Um, there's less pre-em herbicides, so we need the crop competition. So if, if we're not going to have the ability to put two litres of trifluralin down the head of a wheat crop, we need something else to put the pressure on the weeds. So um, there's the, the higher yield uh, that comes with narrow row spacing, so there's some really good established work uh, from across the country and around the world, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So for every uh, inch you go narrower, it's proven you'll pick up 1% in yield. So if you go from 12 inch to 7 inch, there's 5% on the table for you straight away in terms of crop yield. And that's not done in high rainfall areas, that's work that's come out of uh, a fairly dry area of WA and it's been replicated across New South Wales as well. This is a big thing we've observed, is this under our stripper stubbles is the soil temperature. So it's allowing us to keep more soil water from this year we had a lot of five and, and eight mil rain events through, um, through sort of, I guess, April, May, and where our, our knife point burn system, we, we were unable to get the crops to take advantage of that. 
under some of our stripper stubbles, we could see that in the summertime, uh, the, the temperature of those soils was around 32 degrees, uh, whereas the bare soil um, was up to 52 degrees. So that, that, that just, it's, it's basic physics, is that the, the moisture is lost when you've got uh, no cover. So that's, that's been repeatable year on year, we're seeing that. Oh, sorry. And the other thing we're seeing with the narrow rows is that it's assisting harvest weed seed control. So in that big six, we, we originally were narrow windrow burning, cutting short to collect the, harv the har harvest of weed seeds, put them in a row and then burn them. That doesn't work when you're harvesting high. So we wanted to come up with other tactics and with narrow rows, ryegrass or wild oats, they, they seek the light as opposed to being on wide rows where they tend to drop down between the, uh, the, the 12 and 13 and 15 inch rows. So it's allowing more weed seeds to be captured in harvest weed seed systems that we weren't doing before. And, and Michael Walsh is here today. We're really lucky to see his group with John Bross and others doing some, I guess, cutting edge work that no one else in the country is doing in the world and measuring some of the, uh, the capture, firstly, in stripper systems versus the, uh, the rotting um, un under the, uh, the different systems of chaff lining or chaff decks. So narrow rows, there's a uh, 160 plants per square metre Trojan crop from 2016. They don't always work like that. And we get a bit of pushback too in terms of people in drier areas saying, well, you're going to put yourself at risk of screens and poorer grain quality. It doesn't change your target plant populations. All you're doing is changing your spatial distribution. So it's where you place the, the crop. So rather than having it on 12 inch, you, you still, I don't know what your target plants per square metre might be here for wheat or barley, but say if you're targeting 80 plants or even 60 plants, you're still putting that same number of plants per square metre out there, you're just distrib distributing them differently. So you, you're sort of occupying more space that the weeds don't get a chance to, capturing more sunlight and shading more soil. So it's 1% higher yield per inch narrower. So it's the one thing you take home from my talk, that, 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 that's, that's probably it. So Glenn Reifmuller, WA at Meriden, uh, did this work um, over 29 years and a whole lot of crop sequences and, and it's fairly well proven at some points where uh, he got up to sort of 1.5% high yield. But um, Brendan Scott captured a lot of that in the CSU um, Graham Centre work on, uh, on row spacing across 160 trials. And even Guy McMullen from New South Wales DPI at, uh, at Tamworth got work showing that um, there's a six to sixteen dollar a hectare loss in uh, in yield. With, this is cereals with uh, every inc every one centimetre increase in row spacing. So weed, competi weed competition data. Chris Preston for us in the south done some really good work showing the combination. So this is not using row spacing in isolation. The combination of pre-emergence, early sowing, and and hybrid seed hybrid canola actually reduced your seed set by fifty percent in ryegrass. 50%, they're massive numbers. I mean, you just read through some of these papers and these are really high populations of weeds. You just can't ignore that reduction in seed set. And Michael Witterick, who's here today, I see down the back, um, has done some great work with um, some of the broadleaf weeds, um, such as sow thistle, um, flea bane, um, and he's also got all the almost barnyard grasses in pulses of all crops. So we think pulses aren't a particularly competitive crop, like favoured beans and chickpeas. They're terrible for crop competition. All you do is change some of those row spacing and, and Michael's picking up uh, some pretty impressive data on, on the weed, weed suppression. So I, I guess there's so much data, there's so many resistant weeds, so we, we all know, that, know the status on, on resistance. Um, I, I think it's just a time for a shift in our thinking. I don't have the direct answers for you, but it's just to go away from today and have a, a bit of a think about what uh, some of the tools that you can put into your, into your system. So the stripper front, you've heard a little bit about it, it's just a, a rearward rotating um, a drum that just basically takes the, uh, takes the grain off the head, 85% um, of that is threshed in the front, so it doesn't put a lot of uh, wear and tear on the header. We've had some work done by John Francis to sort of quantify some of this in terms of the economic value of it, um, and, and it's basically reducing that depreciation in the R&M on the header like Peter mentioned, so it's good to hear it from his perspective as well. So there's limited chaff going through the header. So I guess there's that, the attraction of a huge capacity, the 50 to 70 tonne an hour. In reality, the growers we work with that have been doing this for a few, few years, that 50 is a good number. They're happy to sit on cereals at 50 tonne an hour. Works well, they can keep the grain away um, and they can avoid sort of some of those downgrades with, with wet harvest. Less fuel, so there's 50% per hectare or per tonne. That, that, that's a big, a big saving. 
high harvest, so less cost, less head of wear, less R&M, less depreciation, so some of those drivers. Uh, we've seen there's no need for a MAV or a power cast in some of our systems, so that's interesting. Um, you're just not trying to spread that 40 foot at 12 metres in a CTF system, so you're basically just ripping the heads off. Um, you're leaving that tall stubble, and we're sort of finding this lift in fallow efficiency in terms of water stored over the summer. So it changes the dynamic of some of the summer weeds that come up. Um, it is a bit more challenging to spray because you've obviously got a higher target to work from with that straw standing there. There's no data on this, so John Kierkegaard through some of the new farming systems work, hopefully we'll look at quantifying it. The researchers can't really put a stripper front into plots. Um, and I'd like to say Michael Walsh and his team are doing some work on looking at ryegrass and brome grass as to how they can strip the weed seeds um, and, and measure with a shellborn, measure what's actually being captured. So this is a, a photo from a local grower, um, 2016, Latrobe Barley, 82, 30 case, 12 metre CTF. The draper was doing 35 tonne an hour, which is acceptable. It was relatively lodged in places, but they were at 100% engine power. Uh, with the stripper, the power, and uh, only 60 to 70% engine power. So that was, that was a straight up comparison. But like all things in agriculture, there's compromises. Um, it's not all beer and Skittles. So there's some work from Michael and his team at Mara last year comparing the stripper and, and the draper with, with weed seed capture. Grain loss, so condition work have actually measured high levels of grain loss with the stripper, so particularly at the front uh, in, in a John Deere, but also in case headers they've measured more grain loss out through the rotor. So setup is critical. And I, I guess the growers who've been in this system in our part of the world have worked on this for a couple of years. The first year they were frustrated with it, Second year got better, and after the third year, and through some really good dealer support in our part of the world, they're, they're, getting, it, they're getting it better. So we, we sort of need to quantify a bit more in detail in some of the red headers, the losses, but we're, we're getting better on the green ones. Keeping grain away is a challenge, so if you've got 60 tonne an hour coming at you, how do you deal with that? And the performance varies with the season and the header. So we had some frosted, stem frosted wheat last year that we had late rain and regrew. At the, the efficiency of trying to get some of that green stem material through the, uh, through the stripper wasn't as good. Uh, sieve capacity, so we, we, it was a comment a grower made, the John Deere has a smaller sieve capacity, so if you can um, improve that uh, capacity with a, with a shellborne, that helps, whereas with a, a New Holland, it's already a 50 tonne an hour header, so probably not as essential in terms of lifting that capacity. They're, they're grower comments, so on. Uh, and we've sort of found, Peter said this as well, avoiding wide rows. So once we get wider than 10 inch, wider than 250 mils, the stripper just doesn't work as well. You don't have that constant feed coming against the, uh, the front. So that, that's a really important thing we observed. And there's also the cost of an extra front. You've got another $110,000 front sitting in the shed. So it's, um, the, the, the header doesn't wear out as much and the fronts don't wear out as much, but still there's that extra cost. So a few local examples, so I spoke to David Ricardo about his work at Walgett, so they were looking to do it for two reasons, improve their fallow efficiency and secondly uh, get more capacity out of the headers. His take home message for me, he said it's just the, the, equal to having two headers. So they, in 2016, they had a wheat crop doing six tonne, um, the stripper front was equal to, to two headers running side by side. So that, he was, he was really uh, impressed with it. They're probably having a few more challenges of how they'll manage the stubble, but he said that's just logistics and machinery set up. And we've heard from, from Peter and Kylie today as well, so that was really exciting to see people in the, in the northern region actually having a crack at some of these systems. So Aristotle in 330 BC, um, it, it's, it's, not, it's the sum of the parts. So all the bits you put together gives the outcome at, at the end. It's, it, you can't just go away and say, well, I'm gonna buy a stripper front, but you still got the old gyral in the shed on, on six inch tines. It's not gonna work. You've gotta sort of incorporate the whole system to get the best out of it. So it's that synergy. We're, we're really looking at that 100% tall standing cover, that surface mulch, and uh, the dish cutting through that tall stubble and that stubble shading. And it's, it's creating some emerging agronomy for us that we hadn't really dreamed of. So Peter made the comment about cover crops in the US. So they're all about living roots for as much time in the soil as possible. So we're doing that with some of our winter wheats, for example. We sow a crop in late March, go, get it to go right. There's varieties like Longsword and Kitty Hook. They'll grow right through to November. So we're getting our nine months out of it. It might be practical in your part of the world. Winter canola is another option. 
So there's, there's agronomy options coming out there that we hadn't even uh, dreamed of and it's, uh, it's quite interesting the way growers are, uh, are looking to adopt it. Nutrient cycling, so the soils are wetter for longer. So we're measuring high levels of mineralisation that we haven't sort of been able to quantify yet, but because they are wetter for longer, things are more available. And then obviously improving soil biota and that harvest weed seed opportunity. So take home messages from strip and disc. I guess you've got to look at the whole system to gain the greatest benefit, not just bits in isolation, so not just having a disc seeder or a stripper front or going to narrow rows. Uh, it's that emerging agronomy, so there's probably things we haven't dreamed up yet that will come forward in the next couple of years. Um, the innovation is not without its challenges, and again, I take my hat off to the growers in this space. They're the ones that put their head down and, and, and scratch, their, scratch their head when they've got grain loss or they've got, uh, uh, I guess, capacity issues and work out a way to do it better. And growers are the leaders in this space. Um, there's not a lot of data, but hopefully that will come at some point. So thank you and, and keep sharing your experiences.